All right, why don't, why don't we get started? Um, I'm, I'm Scott Podolsky, and I help to uh, organize our departmental uh, seminar series. And as many of you know, our Department of Global Health and Social Medicine has been honored to team up with the Harvard University Native American Program over the past two years to host a series of seminars devoted to the health of indigenous peoples. This is a critical part of our overall academic seminar series. And for this, we've been grateful for the wisdom and input of my colleague, Joe Gan. I'll get to introduce Professor Gan himself, and he'll have the honor of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Stephanie Rousseau Carroll. Joseph Gan is Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine in our department and Professor of Anthropology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge. He's collaborated for 20, over 25 years with American Indian and other indigenous communities to rethink community-based mental health services and to harness traditional culture and spirituality for advancing indigenous well-being. He's an enrolled member of the Aani Grovan Tribal Nation of Montana, and among many other roles, is the director of the Harvard University Native American Program and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. So with that, I'll hand this over to Professor Gan. And just to remind you all that this um, series will be available on our YouTube channel through HMS Global Health and Social Medicine. Hand off to Professor Gan. Thank you, Scott. I so appreciate your uh, helping to introduce us every week um, because I think it affords us a bit of a seamless link into the seminar series for our department. Um, as everyone on this call probably knows already, we try to disseminate and advertise these sessions, especially widely, um, particularly to reach our colleagues and friends in Indian country um, to better uh, access some of the knowledge that our tremendous speakers are able to bring. So it's my pleasure today to uh, open our uh, Indigenous Health and Wellbeing Colloquium series to introduce uh, Dr. Stephanie Carroll. Before I do that, however, I want to acknowledge uh, the land and people um, on which Harvard University sits. Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. And the Harvard University Native American program went through a process of consulting with Massachusetts folks to develop this acknowledgement because um, acknowledgements without consultation and engagement and interaction in relationship with people can be a little bit empty. So we try to model uh, that kind of interaction and on really uh, large events on campus, we try to make sure to invite um, members of the Massachusetts tribe to actually formally welcome us uh, to their territory as well. Um, today's business, of course, is to um, welcome Dr. Stephanie Carroll who is an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. Dr. Carroll is a citizen of the native village of Kudaka in Alaska and of Sicilian descent. At the University of Arizona, she is assistant professor of public health, associate director for the Native Nations Institute, and acting director, assistant research professor at the Udall Center. Her research group, the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance, develops research, policy, and practice innovations for indigenous data sovereignty. Stephanie chairs the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, the International Indigenous Data Sovereignty Interest Group at the Research Data Alliance, and the Indigenous Data Working Group for the IEEE P2890 Recommended Practice for Provenance of Indigenous People's Data. Dr. Carroll will be talking to us today about healing through data, sovereignty, and governance for Indigenous data futures. Uh, Dr. Carroll, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, um, Joe, and thank you, Dr. Um, and I want to begin, I will start sharing my slides in a moment, but Siduk Atna Kastan, Siduk Stephanie Carroll, Tishu Sta, Sandek Nalchina. Um, again, I'm Stephanie Carroll. Um, I'm coming to you from the lands of the Otham and Yaqui peoples here in what's now Chuxan or Tucson, Arizona. And um, I really want to acknowledge um, all of you who are on this call. I see many um, mentors, colleagues, and friends here um, who have a vast um, array of knowledge and experience in implementing Indigenous data governance strategies that uphold the sovereignty of um, Indigenous peoples, particularly in health research. Um, I also want to give a little background of myself, um, and I'll start really by saying that um, the root of all my research really is love and relationships. Um, and it started um, with where um, I came from in terms of my family and my um, upbringing within the academy as well. And so um, here you see pictures um, on the on the left of that baby is me actually of four generations um, of um, Sicilian women. Um, and then in the center is that baby is actually my father. Um, 
up in Chitna, Alaska. Um, and there's me um, as a um, up in Alaska as well. And finally, just a shout out to all of my um, colleagues and friends who do this work um, and really think about it in a way that is grounded to the, the lands and our responsibilities to both our human relations and our non-human relations. Um, and so I come to this perspective from a background that combines um, academic training in indigenous studies, science and technology studies, um, research methods, um, and within the disciplines of public health and social sociology primarily. Um, as as um, Dr. Gon said, I um, direct the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance. Um, we are a diverse set of um, researchers and um, community members who are from a number of different disciplines, ranging from um, law to public health to bench sciences, such as soil science or microbiology, um, and social sciences, such as sociology and public policy. And together we um, support uh, and, and train emerging scholars to be able to do this work in their own way for their own um, purposes. And um, we really work to forefront the understanding that science and research is inherently political, especially for Indigenous peoples. So um, as Indigenous uh, researchers, we're not walking two paths. This is our walk, bringing our whole selves to our practice. Um, And here you see my grounding and in, in the fact that I firmly work towards the understanding and uh, to rectify the situation where in terms of health perspectives, every disease really has two causes in terms of pathophysiological and political. And so some of the work that I do really tries to rectify some of the political um, and settler colonial paradigms. So I'll begin with a quick tour of key points and positioning statements uh, to shift us towards the future and, and using research and data as strengths to transform relationships with indigenous peoples to transform um, our lives as indigenous peoples. And so first and foremost, sovereignty matters and is central to relationships, be they government to government, research, data, or otherwise. Um, so indigenous peoples in America hold inherent sovereignty, including peoples in the continental states, Alaska, Hawaii, and the territories of American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and I apply this more broadly within international context, which I'll talk to on briefly. So it's important to understand that before colonization, Indigenous peoples lived healthy, vibrant lives that were aligned with our values um, and our worldviews and our relations um, with non-humans. So over the past 500 years, as we've had um, the settler or colonial experience, uh, we've really been confronted um, with various efforts to kill, suppress, or co-opt um, Indigenous peoples as collectives, um, as individuals, and our knowledge systems. So while today uh, in the US, the, the um, we are only a small fraction of the total US population because of systematic harms and systemic violence, um, and the government sanctioned policies and practices that have and continue to attempt to decimate our health and well being. Um, and so, settler colonial efforts to suppress Indigenous um, knowledges likewise sought to wipe out the traditions that we had to promote health and well being. Um, and often sought to replace these systems with federal projects. Um, so these projects largely don't uphold treaty and trust obligations to support the health and well-being of our peoples um, and are actually sometimes um, in the background set up to measure how well the colonial project is actually going itself. So how well are they able to erase us and decimate us? So while we think about um, health outcomes rates across tribes, they generally vary, um, but they're, they are similar in that across generations, what we've seen is that we have the highest rate of premature death in the country now. Often we link these health inequities to the social determinants of the health, such as economics and education, or structural determinants like racism and discrimination. However, at the very root of these social and structural disparities lies um, this really well-coordinated um, and not historic, but ongoing effort to control us as Indigenous peoples, to diminish us, and to erase us. 
um, and at the same time to use as one of the most powerful tools um, resources to disconnect us from our lands. And so our health is intimately tied to our connections to non-humans, particularly the land. But nevertheless, we exist and thrive. Um, so this is due in large part to our um, indigenous knowledges, those relations we have with lands and non-humans, and indigeneity, the innovation and persistence that really sustains us in the face of continuous attempts at colonial subjugation. So often data have been used to further assess the project of the colonial um, efforts to kill and erase indigenous people. So as indigenous peoples, as collectives, we need decolonized, indigenized data for decision-making that really shifts the narrative from deficits and deficiencies to well-being, resurgence, and persistence. And at the same time, tribes are enacting relational responsibilities to their data, governing their data in ways that align with their values and interests. So these include data that tribes own and control, as well as data created, stewarded, and, and used by others. So at its base, these data are our relations, linking us as Indigenous peoples to our responsibilities to the information and the people and the non-humans to which it relates. So finally, um, time and time again, Indigenous communities have shown that when they call the shots, when they create and give life to programs, when they embody relations with their data, when they apply their knowledge systems to humanities um, problems, their people and communities, health and well-being thrives. So how can we as researchers, um, as repositories, as funders, as service providers, and as other institutions support the shift to self-determined community-engaged science and research practices. One important way is through changing data relationships to support Indigenous data sovereignty through implementing tools for Indigenous data governance. And that's what the whole next rest of my 50-something odd minutes will focus on. So we really want to think about how do we move institutions from extractive transactional colonial data practices and reconfigure power relationships to put indigenous data in indigenous hands. So I want to begin by acknowledging that to include indigenous people's knowledges and data in science and technology advances, we must be able to maintain relationships between people's information and in place within our technological infrastructure, both to protect knowledge and data and allow indigenous peoples to benefit from sharing knowledge and data on their own terms. So over the past 10 years or so, there's been this ongoing narrative that has compared data to oil and has talked really about how um, data is the new oil, the new big resource that we have. And one of the things um, that I wanna point out is that the systemic and systematic challenges persist. As big data companies collectively um, rack up billions and billions of, of profit um, around data um, every single quarter, year, um, we have this ongoing, um, divergence of understanding that these data are not separate from us. They are us. They are us as individuals. And importantly, from Indigenous perspectives, and increasingly so um, in mainstream perspectives, they are us as collectives. And so being able to maintain persistent relationships really is important. But one of the challenges that has come up, um, and even more so um, late, lately as we move towards um, open access and open science paradigms that are being pushed strategically through government agencies and elsewhere um, is this uh, fulfilling the mantra of open, open, open. So as data intensive scientific discovery becomes more common, open science supports supposedly the sharing, preservation, provenance, reproducibility, uh, reproducibility of things like data, software, um, scientific workflows. So at its heart, open science really has been um, positioned as a movement to make scientific data more accessible and equitable, but really is that true? Um, who's deciding what's equitable? What if I said that there were critical components of how, when, and where data are made open that actually make it more harmful and less equitable? Um, so I'm gonna begin now and talk about um, some positioning statements about um, where I'm um, coming from in terms of the research that I do, and then talk more about how Indigenous data governance uh, innovations are moving forward to um, promote Indigenous rights within um, external data positions and what tribes are doing at the same time. And so I'm just going to start by saying, um, 
from a health perspective, we've had community-based uh, participatory research as a legacy um, and a practice within public health and, and medical research for decades now. Um, and so we've really had this notion of tribal involvement, particularly, or community involvement um, throughout the research process. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'll wrap up with the same slide to say, you know, we think about how do you build partnerships um, and collect data and, and create research. Um, but increasingly so today, because of open science regimes and because of the movement of data through systems, we need to be able to think about not only are data um, something that happens within a research environment, but it, they are put in and dropped into other environments and they move and flow and are used in different ways. So how can we have persistent relationships as Indigenous peoples with our data that come out of research and that come out of the many other spheres of um, data pr production today? Um, and so this um, this scale here comes out of climate research, but it could be applied to almost any research um, that's going on across the globe today. So my colleague, Dominique David Chavez, through her dissertation project, developed the scale of levels of Indigenous community engagement in research to assess for how researchers access Indigenous knowledge systems and how they engage with communities on and community members who maintain those systems. And so it's de developed from particip participatory agricultural research, but you can see flavors of, of community-based participation participatory research and other participatory processes in it. And it's really based on who holds authority and governance in the research process, ranging from no engagement um, to, on the left and to community engagement in the middle to self-determined indigenous-led processes on the right. So um, what she did was apply uh, a global systematic review analyzing 20 years of climate studies then including indigenous knowledges and really found that uh, the vast majority of those climate studies um, either had no engagement up through um, consultative engagement where community members were asked for opinions and consulted, but the decisions were largely being made by researchers. Um, I'd say from a, from a health perspective, we really see a lot of our research happen in the middle where there's more collaboration and sometimes collegial activities happening, but really what we want to think about is um, how do we move towards this right end of the spectrum where there's ind indigenous research governance happening um, so that we can shift to self-determined community engaged science. Um, and one important way is through changing data relationships. And another important consideration um, from, a, from a policy perspective are, is that there are a number of opportunities to apply Indigenous data governance. And so in an international effort led by Dr. Nana Bagarisan for out of UCLA, um, we updated a review of how nation state policies address Indigenous concerns for genomics research. So the publication details specifically how the U.S. common rule regulating human subjects research, um, seen here in this red box, um, and also in that column with lots of gray, uh, fails to protect tribal collective rights and interests. So there's no requirements to engage communities for community approval for secondary use of data and specimens. There's no community approval research of research for findings before release. And the common rule does not provide sanctions for misuse of samples or data. So while this is disappointing, we know that the common rule, which was recently updated, will likely unlikely change anytime soon, which really demands action in other sections sectors, such as federal sectors, universities, tribal policies, and pr research practices themselves. And so um, one of the other interesting aspects is, uh, is that from um, Indigenous perspectives, and um, one of our postdocs, Dr. Riley Tatingfong, um, published an article of a meta-analysis of um, indigenous perspectives on privacy and confidentiality in genomics research. And what that really showed is that there is this strong interest if you ask an individual about their privacy concerns um, as an individual, they will ask you if you have collective consent. So they're concerned about the collective privacy and confidentiality of their data as well to a large degree. And so figuring out these entanglements is really important. 
One of the other kind of um, ground setting understandings that we need to have here is, so you saw in that there was a lot of gray I pointed out in the column for the US, um, and um, that was based on uh, research policies and practices. So as indigenous data sovereignty and indigenous research sovereignty has really exploded over the past 10 years, we've seen um, changes being made to na national level policies um, in comparable countries. So in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Zealand, Australia, Canada. So these are countries that have similar settler colonial experiences, English languages. Um, and what we see is that um, the US remains lagging in terms of national policy and standards addressing reconciliation of colonial impacts and indigenous rights and ethics in research and data governance in relation to nations, like I said, with colon um, similar colonial legacies. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what these nations are doing, um, but it, it is, we are still left in this, um, and this Dominique David Chavez produced this table for some con congressional testimony that we are none, we got nothing going on here at, at a federal level to, pr to promote and protect increasingly so. Um, and so just one last grounding slide here. I did not make this um, assertion in terms of who is indigenous. And it's really important to think about um, from an inherent sovereignty perspective that we utilize tools um, such as federal recognition and state recognition, but from um, an indigenous perspective, we define who belongs and who we are. Um, and so that's really important to make sure that we're underscoring and be able to think through the, the complexities of um, how indigenous data sovereignty applies um, in, for instance, urban areas and in scenarios where um, you don't have um, official recognition from a nation state. So, um, our peoples, indigenous peoples, have always been data experts and data scientists. Our indigenous knowledge systems have been formed by longitudinal inquiry lasting generations. Um, we test, we form, test, adapt, and refine these knowledge systems um, based on interaction with the environment, observations, scientific training, many other things. Um, and we've also utilized a variety of oral, oral and physical mechanisms for transmitting knowledge and information and recording data. Um, so here you see some tools um, from North America, um, with, starting with the totem pole on the left, going through the Lakota Winter Counts calendar sticks um, from the Otham and um, the uh, wampum belt. But however, by and large, the settler colonial experience has been comprised of various efforts to kill, suppress, or co-opt our knowledge systems um, and to squash them. And today, Indigenous people's data includes um, data information and knowledge really in any format basically be anything that can be digitized um, that is generated by indigenous peoples as well as by other governments, private sector um, or institutions. These data are about our peoples, um, about our communities and about our non-human relations. So it is information about specimens and knowledge about the environments and lands, information about indigenous individuals such as our health data, um, census data, corporate data, and information and knowledge about Indigenous peoples as collectives. So that's things like oral histories, our clan knowledges, cultural sites, stories, and belongings. So in the mainstream, data sovereignty has been the concept that information which has been converted and stored in binary digital information. So it's really concerned with that digital information, not what produces or what leads to that digital information, and is subject to the laws of the country in which it is located. Um, data governance itself grew out of um, this uh, corporate environment. And so the values behind it were very much aligned with corporate values. And so what we've seen over time, um, and I use some COVID examples here as I move through this, just because they're relevant and accessible increasingly so by a variety of, op, um, of audiences, is that the suppression, usurpation, and co-optation of indigenous knowledge systems has created and perpetuates a data divide, rendering indigenous peoples largely dependent on other governments, researchers, and institutions for data. So this data dependency is sustained through a paradox of scarcity and abundance, as extensive data are collected about indigenous peoples and nations, but rarely buyer for indigenous peoples 
and nation's purposes. Many of these data do not recognize or privilege indigenous worldviews or benefit indigenous peoples. So as a result, indigenous data landscapes are also are often characterized um, by, let's see if I can get this, there we go, um, inconsistent, inaccurate, and ir irrelevant data for indigenous people. So um, we have this story where the, the, the public data about indigenous people, so whether it's on the Indi in Indian Health Service website, um, or if you look for it, health status information, data are old, sometimes a decade or more um, in age. We also have a lack of community level data. So data are often in the aggregate, aggregate for American Indian or American Indian Alaska Native. Um, and data often describe indigenous peoples and life ways through a deficit lens. So this is often where we're compared with the rest of the population. Um, and even if there's data collected specifically about us, it's actually it's obvious uh, it's often told in a very deficit through a deficit lens. So um, this study here um, was comparing an indigenous sampling of students to the monitoring to the future study. So you see indigenous versus um, quote unquote non-indigenous. Um, however, the analysis was typical and thought through why indigenous students use substances at higher rates, failing to ask critical questions um, that are related to strengths about why do why do we not see increasing rates over age um, as, as student age, what protects them, um, and um, how are Indigenous students resistant and um, resilient in these situations. We also have um, strong issues around external control and ownership of data. Um, and you saw that laid bare um, during um, our, our ongoing coronavirus experiences here um, when tribes had great difficulty accessing their data at local, state, and federal governments. Um, and really this lack of external support for data infrastructure and a lack of visibility um, and, and, and oftentimes a complete erasure of our presence in the data versus seen as this infamous and what was often mean CNN presentation where we as indigenous peoples were just something else. So indigenous data sovereignty um, seeks to rectify this uh, by underscoring that the exercise of sovereignty around data is an inherent right of indigenous peoples, and it's a right to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. So it finds its foundations in inherent sovereignty. Indigenous peoples and nations as rights holders can exercise indigenous data sovereignty. The rest of us can uphold indigenous data sovereignty by putting into place um, policies and practices around indigenous data governance. Indigenous data sovereignty is a responsibility and an expression of the ways, traditions, and roles that communities have for the care and use of their knowledge. Um, it utilizes and leverages the human rights framework, um, including tools um, such as laws, policies, and agreements, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Pe Peoples, nation state recognition of Indigenous Peoples, treaties, and other mechanisms. So Indigenous data sovereignty underscores that knowledge belongs to the collective and is fundamental to who we are as Indigenous peoples. So if we think back to those mainstream definitions of data sovereignty and data governance, what we see here is that Indigenous data sovereignty expands beyond digital information so that we can protect and promote um, and care for all our responsibilities as they are digitized. Um, and it expands beyond jurisdictional geography to allow persistent relationships with data, specimens, information, and knowledge across time and space. Um, and from fundamentally from a governance perspective, it incorporates indigenous values and ways of being and doing into the governance ecosystem. So um, as in, indigenous peoples are um, rebuilding and re-exerting their sovereignty, um, they're also rebuilding their data systems. And so they have these kind of twin needs and exercises going on. They need data for governance. So they need that decolonized, indigenized data that meets their needs for um, community de development, for assurance of well being, and so forth. And at the same time, Indigenous nations, um, like other nations and governments and um, communities, as well as institutions and corporations are setting up and creating mechanisms for um, the governance of data. So indigenous data governance then is a means of implementing greater indigenous data sovereignty. 
Um, so indigenous data sovereignty is disruptive and represents more than merely a shift in the lens we use to analyze data or moving towards a positive focus on success, although that's appreciated and needed. It requires deep in interrogation of our knowledge systems, power, and relationships. And as one tribal member told, or one tribal leader told me, it is really about making what's old new again, or moving towards indigenous design of data policy and practice and infrastructure that weave together current experience and skills with the teachings and lear learnings from our ancestors. So these issues of data access and control are ever present today. Um, for instance, during the sharing of COVID information, um, New Mexico was hailed as a leader for open access to um, zip code level data early on. However, at the same time, New Mexico was not sharing data directly with tribes before making it public or gaining tribal permission to publicly share tribal data. Um, in contrast, here in Arizona, all tribal level data were defined that were uh, which were defined by zip code were repressed in just, until um, the tribe grants permission for sharing openly, openly, which some tribes have done. So this begs us to think about. Um, that indigenous nations have various levels of control or possession of their data with high levels of control over their tribal enrollment data, for instance, and very little control over social and corporate data. So data work then for indigenous nations as rights holders really requires these relationships with other data actors, both for expertise in collecting and accessing data and using data for governance, as well as through relationships where external data stewards uh, manage Indigenous data by Indigenous standards, and this in, um, occurs via implementing Indigenous data governance. So given resource constraints, it's also really important to think about um, the fact that tribes need to identify what data are most important to share um, and most important to protect. So there's a lot of things going on at the same time. So the important question then becomes, how do we embed indigenous people's rights, interests, expectations, and responsibilities into the creation of information and knowledge infrastructure to enhance access to an indigenous governance of data? The ownership, uh, the overarching goal really is to translate the ways that communities have for the care and use of their knowledge into the digital environment. And so, um, even though indigenous data sovereignty, the movement um, is a movement of making what's old new again um, and um, accessing and promoting how we've always done things in our communities and how we've emerged and, and, trans and transformed over the years, um, there has been a, a very consistent and persistent effort around indigenous data sovereignty that spanned the globe since about 2015, um, beginning with um, the kind of coining, coining of the term indigenous data sovereignty at a meeting in um, Australia. And so since then, there's been a no number of nation state um, or collective based um, uh, networks for indigenous data sovereignty that have been started in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the United States, Australia, um, for Pacifica people. Um, there's the First Nations Information Governance Center, which is um, created actually the OCAP principles over 25 years ago. Um, there's now a SAPMI um, or a SAMI um, network, and there's nascent networks across the globe. Um, occurring. And since that time, there's also um, been the creation of the Global Indigenous uh, Data Alliance, which really works to, as an international network, advance Indigenous data sovereignty and governance um, by, uh, by supporting the assertion of Indigenous people's rights and interest in data and advocating for um, data for the use for self-determined well-being. And so um, this network um, and a plethora of indigenous peoples um, and scholars and advocates over the past um, eight or so years have been creating scholarship um, policies and practices around indigenous data sovereignty and indigenous data governance. Um, most of these are um, open access, freely available publications. We have There's the foundational book, Indigenous Data Sovereignty, um, as well as an updated indigenous data sovereignty and policy book and numerous articles um, around applying um, these um, concepts from on the ground and communities to what institutions need to do. As this, at the same time, there's been an assertion of indigenous data 
data governance principles. And so I'll focus on and talk about the very broad high level care principles for indigenous data governance. But I wanna give a nod to that these high level principles really point down to regional principles. So things like the principles of Maori data sovereignty, but also OCAP um, or, um, which are the principles for First Nations. Um, and like I said, those were created over 25 years ago, have recently been updated to reflect this real um, generation of knowledge and, acts and um, activity within the arena. And so those broad principles point to regional principles, which then point you down to communities themselves to look at what governance policy and protocols communities have for their own data. So um, to move to talking about those high level care principles, um, those principles were created in response to the increased generation of use of data in open science um, and related environments and the companion limited opportunities for indigenous control within those environments. So a network of indigenous scholars led the development of the care principles through the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. Um, and they really set forth critical considerations for non-tribal data actors, um, so data creators, data stewards, data users, um, and are designed to guide the inclusion of Indigenous peoples in data governance and increase their access to and benefit from data. So the care principles shift the focus of data governance from consultation to values-based relationships and have been wi widely recognized as enriching the discussion of collective rights to data for other populations as well. And so that focus on um, values and relationships was intentional. So when the, the care principles were created, on the left side here, you see um, we looked at a, a, at a number of, and this is just a uh, um, a few examples of mainstream data principles. You see the FAIR principles, which are now very pervasive, uh, persistent in our in our data our activities, um, and um, that that dark gray means that the vast majority of the principles within those standards have to do with data themselves. So making it accessible. Um, making it actionable, making it measurable, that type of stuff. But when you looked at what indigenous entities had set out, so what tribes had set out, what um, uh, regional entities had set out, they're largely more focused on people-oriented principles. So things about um, exercising control, relationships, authority, and obligations. And so we really um, purposefully said, look at the mainstream is covering these data, these data, um, oriented set of ideas. We need to think about what indigenous peoples are trying to say about their data relationships and how do we set out this very high level standard. And so that's how we created the care principles, which went through about a year long vetting process of getting um, in, input and, and um, feedback from everybody from um, at the community level to um, international conferences. So the care principles include four principles and three, which have three sub principles each. Their collective benefit, which details that data ecosystems shall be designed and function in ways that enable indigenous peoples as collectives to benefit from data. Um, authority control, which really focuses on um, an indigenous rights and interest in data and their um, and their uh, ability and need to govern that data. Responsibility reminds us that those working with indigenous data must center indigenous people's self-determination and collective benefit in data relationships. So we need to center collective benefit and the authority control in all of our data relationships and ground those relationships in um, in a dialogue of ethics. So we need to understand that each of us comes from our own experience of what ethics mean. Um, but when we're dealing with indigenous people's data um, and research, really grounding that those ethics in community and understanding how those ethics grow from a dialogue of the ethics that we gain through, um, for instance, academic training or from our own community experiences and how we adhere to community expectations. So as I said, the care principles bring a people and purpose orientation to data governance, um, which complements the data centric nature of the popular FAIR principles, which are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So the FAIR principles seek to increase data sharing and implementation and FAIR and care together should be seen as necessary to allow indigenous peoples to govern, access, and use their data and to share on their own terms. And the reasons for that are that currently the vast majority of indigenous data ranging from ethnographic material to biological samples to earth observations and so on, so on are neither fair nor care. Um, so indigenous collections and data can be hard to find. They can be buried in larger collections, 
um, data sets, repositories, actually in researcher possessions. Um, and indigenous data are often mislabeled. So they don't indicate who the indigenous peoples are who are related to those data. Um, and since they are not um, well, um, um, that's not indicated, they're not searchable to a large degree. So indigenous peoples um, also are largely not the legal rights holders. Thus, indigenous collections and data are not fair and do not perpetuate indigenous provenance, protocols for use and sharing, or permissions. So CARE was created to be complementary of FAIR and to, and to make sure that there is a continuing relationship with data. And FAIR really helps to move that forward. Um, but CARE itself applies across a broader spectrum of activities than the FAIR principles do. So CARE practice needs to occur in data collection in terms of, for example, things like defining cultural metadata, um, recording provenance in metadata. We need to engage CARE and data stewardship by using appropriate government governance models and be, by making data FAIR. Um, we need to implement CARE in the data community. Um, we need to see greater infusion of indigenous ethics um, that inform access to data um, and uh, reuse of data into the future. We need to use tools for transparency and integrity and provenance. And we need to use fair and care um, in data applications. So we're concerned about implementing fair and care on already existing data, as well as instituting policies and practices to operationalize fair and care in the ongoing creation of new data that incorporates indigenous knowledges. So some of the tools to make this real a reality include using indigenous people's own laws, policies, and practices, and investing in indigenous data systems. Updating other governments and institutions' policies and practices is another necess necessary step towards ethical inclusion of indigenous knowledge in external data systems. And so these kind these tools and mechanisms cross different um, care principles. So it's not like you use one tool to enact each principle. There's different tools that, that touch on each of um, the uh, different principles in their practice. So um, these tools must be grounded in indigenous peoples, nations, and communities. So again, back to that really pointing down to communities in, towards, uh, in terms of informing practical tools, policy and legislation, research and engagement, um, and creating training programs and creating formal um, policies and, and standards as well. And so um, governing indigenous data then really is about how do we, um, infuse indigenous rights and values into institutions and decision-making structures. Um, and part of that is through policies and procedures um, and practices. And so a few mechanisms for data governance include things like legislation. So that could be tribal legislation, um, or it could be legislation um, that includes um, how you engage with tribes around data um, or research practices. Um, and so that's things like, um, you know, if the common rule addressed um, community engagement, for instance, um, in a meaningful way. It's by using metadata that records provenance and attribution, for instance, um, by using cultural protocols um, and including that in metadata. So things like, um, who can or cannot access um, data, what time of, of year could it be accessed or not, um, by using um, agreements such as MOA, MOAs, MOUs, data sharing agreements, um, by creating stewardship guidelines, by accessing and utilizing intellectual property law, and by, um, by um, thinking about and applying the restrictions that we already have for um, the transfer of knowledge within our communities. So if you think about if there's a ban in the community of uh, recording um, ceremony, for instance, that is um, a protocol and a practice that is meaningful in thinking about how do we move to the digital environment. So really, the goal is to create these law policy, ethics, and infrastructure so, to support indigenous rights to indigenous data throughout the data life cycle and across the data ecosystem. So we also are looking to strengthen such rights by making changes, even minimal at first, across data actors, such as research institutions, repositories, publishers, funders, and more. Um, right now, admittedly, most of us don't know what we're doing. A lot of this activity around data and data policy is really new for everybody, which ultimately means that we have the opportunity to do it 
magnificently aligned with the plethora of rights, interests, and expectations that exist. So the remainder of my conversation here with you is going to focus on some activities that are, are um, occurring kind of at high levels, but also on the ground that inform Indigenous data governance and how we move towards um, healing our data relationships. Um, and so I'm going to talk about um, how as scholars, community-based researchers, and academics, um, we move through and, and apply um, practices around authority, access, authorship, attribution, and acknowledgement in our research. So to begin with, um, authority um, really thinks about how do we center Indigenous peoples and people in leadership and scholarship? How do we seek and pay for guidance from Indigenous leadership and scholars? Um, how do we access existing tribal expectations to set um, institutional policies and practices? And how do we support the growth of tribal policies and practices through funding um, tribes, tribal colleges, tribal nonprofits, um, tribal scholars to be doing this work? I'm going to just um, talk about three examples of this. Um, and the first is thinking about um, how um, Indigenous scholars are, are revealing the expectations that tribes already have. And so um, Dr. Ibrahim Garba um, and now a large team have been looking at tribal research codes. Um, and this is broadly conceived as tribal IRBs, tribal review processes, um, and um, tribal policies around research um, review. Um, and so in addition to trying to respond to requests from tribes um, to look at what's going on in this arena, um, it's, it's an opportunity to identify areas of concerns and opportunity for tribal law and policy to respond to the ethics and policy gaps we see with um, the common rule and within our disciplines and within our practices now, and to create meaning, meaningful strategies to foster individual and collective tribal um, permissioning and participation in research and data environments. And so we're uh, reviewing 30 publicly um, available um, tribal, um, and I'll explain what that is, codes across 13 themes. So these are the 13 themes there. Um, there are 22 tribal research or institutional review board sets of documents, five um, sets of documents from tribal colleges or universities. So these are tribal colleges or universities who review on behalf of tribes, and then three regional organizations who have that same responsibility um, to review on behalf of tribes as well. Um, and so this research has has been um, starting to be released through publications. There are two out. The first details how we use Indigenous standards, such as research review processes that have been set by tribes to implement the care principles. And basically what it says um, in that paper is that this is these are some of the, the bits and pieces that tribes have set out. So they are in writing for you to understand about what their expectations are. And so um, and it has examples from tribal codes that detail things like um, you can you must follow tribal um, uh, law and traditional law about when when data and information can be accessed, meaning some certain seasons you can access certain types of information and certain seasons you cannot. Um, the second publication that's been put out um, looks at extending the care principles from tribal research policies to benefit sharing and genomic research, um, and that also provides examples of tribal codes and how those tribal codes and policies detail um, what the benefits are that tribes are looking for um, in research relationships and um, how those benefits need to be enacted. Um, and so this is really important because as, as um, research sovereignty and data sovereignty um, really catapults to the fore for Indigenous peoples, there's increasing um, asks of tribes to um, create these relationships about research and data. So it's important for us as researchers to be able, and other outside institutions to be able to um, take the responsibility on us to look at what are the expectations that have already been set. And are we even meeting those minimal expectations? Um, in terms of uh, moving towards 
um, indigenous led research um, and action. Um, just one emerging example is the Native Biodata Consortium, which has been advancing biobanking and digital tools for indigenous data governance. Um, they are the first indigenous led biological and data repositories within tribal jurisdiction. Um, they are a nonprofit organization um, organized under tribal and federal law. Um, and so run by and for indigenous peoples um, and doing important work to advance how we as indigenous people set the standards for um, governing data and specimens. Now moving on to access and attribution. Um, I want to note that as we release the care principles and move towards thinking about what next, um, one of the really important things that came out was um, how do we, at the nexus of the care principles and the fair principles, think about an advanced metadata um, in terms of provenance, permissions, attribution, and protocols, and embedding those metadata so that they travel with data through the data lifecycle um, and across the data ecosystem. Um, and so, as mentioned, indigenous data is often buried in large repositories. It can be challenging to identify and locate. Um, and so an important first step really is to move towards uh, making data fair um, and by acknowledging the amount of indigenous um, data that's on the platform and then rectifying the situation um, around that uh, around that metadata. And so just um, I'm going to highlight two actions that are going on, but there's a lot of activity in this realm right now. Um, one of them you heard when Dr. Gon introduced me, um, I'm the chair of a working group to create a recommended practice for the provenance of Indigenous people's data. This is through the IEEE, which stands for the International um, Electrical and Electro, I don't, it, it's an engineering set, but they set the major standards for data, one of the two or three major international bodies for data standard setting. Um, and so we're going through a formal process of creating the first um, indigenous data standard within it. Um, we're also a little bit blowing out their process because they're a very Roberts rule of, of order um, entity. And so there's a very formal process that you that you fall through. And we've inserted um, into the middle of that, which we will um, begin doing within the next month or two, this community engagement process. And so our, our draft will be voted on within a week to be released publicly for comment. Um, and then there will be the responsibilities of a number of us to bring that draft to communities, um, to um, indigenous led organizations and um, um, and professional societies and other um, data professional side societies to gain feedback on that. The engagement will move through the Global Indigenous Data Alliance website. So this, this recommended practice will detail the rules by which the provenance of Indigenous people's data should be described and recorded um, by outlining the core parameters for providing and digitally embedding provenance information for Indigenous people's data. So telling where that data has come from and where, where it's been. Um, and so it supports proper and appropriate disclosure of the ori originating data information and ensures long-term identification of Indigenous people's data for future use. So it connects data to people people in place and when appropriate supporting future benefit sharing options. Um, what are the other metadata um, tools that are out there are put out through um, uh, the traditional knowledge labels and biocultural labels and notices from the local context hub. Um, the local context labels and notices were developed in partnership with indigenous communities globally to enhance Indigenous data governance and to establish the conditions for the sharing and reuse of Indigenous knowledges and intellectual property in digital spaces. So that's another strong example to look at. I'm going to shift to authorship and acknowledgement now um, and, and talk about um, really a, a, a related and important piece of promote, promoting Indigenous data governance um, is related to attribution and, and authorship um, in publications. And as we see open access really begin to even explode even more, we need to think about what are the practices that need to happen um, at, in publishing houses and in our relationships as researchers as we publish not only in journals but as 
we publish data, as we as we present materials, what are our responsibilities? So often individual researchers and groups from outside communities are the ones who are credited for and cited in relation to indigenous or no local knowledges, um, since their names are associated with data sets, publications, and research findings. So uh, these groups often do not have the same responsibilities to the communities and may not be accountable to knowledge holders when sharing the data with third parties. Um, and so it's really important also at the same time to acknowledge that different Indigenous communities may have um, varying needs and perspectives related to authorship. So some may want to restrict community level identifiers, which would include authorship, and others may want to be acknowledged for their contributions, in which case authorship is an important contribution. Um, so we're in a space where there is um, a, a an explosion activity happening in this. So some academic journals are including relevant statements that ultimately affect whether a publication is considered or not. Um, and those similar statements could be made for data sets, whether it's, for instance, recorded um, in a repository. And so examples of this are um, um, there are a set of rural, international rural health journals. Um, you see a citation here from that that I'll talk about in a moment. Also, the Canadian Journal of Public Health, um, the Data Science Journal, they've all set out that uh, this mantra about nothing about us without us. And so um, really asking critical questions about how Indigenous people were involved in and had governance over the processes. Um, so the international rural health journals, um, um, their declaration and publication seen here around cultural, indigenous cultural identity of researchers, research author standards for health research publications, um, sets forth some um, important considerations related to recording um, indigenous belonging, so recording our um, our community belonging in actual citations. Um, also thinking through um, how do we record um, uh, positionality in acknowledgments or other places in publications. Um, and then there's um, a movement too to begin to, as you heard um, Dr. Gon say and myself say, where we were, so on whose lands we are, also to include that when we have to include our author affiliation, so the institutions we're affiliated with. So in proceeding, um, my affiliation with the University of Arizona would be um, on Othman Yaki lands. And so um, these are all movements to try to be able to move towards um, creating uh, uh, proper authorship and um, acknowledgement throughout the system. One of the other things um, is that, you know, we talk a lot about um, all of the human subjects re regulations that we have for individuals. In some institutions, like my home institution, we have expanded expectations um, through our human subjects process for showing um, community engagement and community consent um, in our processes. So having to, for instance, show that we have um, either a resolution or we've gone through a tribal IRB when we're doing work with tribes. Um, and so really expanding um, and thinking about how do we create um, uh, privacy and confidentiality processes and laws that are direct, address collective rights as well as individual rights. Um, and in that work that I told you about by Dr. Riley Tatingfong, we've seen that from Indigenous perspectives, we're thinking about um, how do we as ind individuals relate to coll collective and how do our rights relate when in research relationships. And so really expanding that set of activities. Um, and so now I'm going to close out by, by just talking briefly about some activities that the Global Indigenous Data Alliance is doing beyond the care principles now um, and moving forward. And so um, in the past, we've been socializing care by releasing the principles, translating them into a number of languages, holding education and workshops. Um, and we've seen them included in formal law, policy, and guidelines. Um, and so at the present, what we're thinking about is discussions around Indigenous peoples' rights and data. We'll have a, um, a release of 12 rights that Indigenous peoples have expressed um, around data um, next month. Um, we're also creating criteria for uh, assessing the implementation of the CARE principles. Um, and um, as an organization moving to thinking about more specifically about research data within university environments and the responsibilities of universities in those processes. Um, so these 12 rights and data that I mentioned, um, you see right here, are the right to self-determination, the right to possession, use, consent, 
the right to refuse and the right to reclaim. And those are around the um, data for governance paradigm. So um, having access to and usable data for governance. And then within the governance sphere of how we govern data, the right to govern, the right to define, the right to privacy, the right to know, the right to association and the right to benefit. Um, and so those um, will be out in detail in March released by Gita. Um, one of the other efforts I said was to have indicators around um, assessing the care principles. And this follows, um, for instance, the FAIR principles um, have another of um, models to assess implementation of FAIR. They have the FAIR data maturity model. And so um, we're moving to um, have um, basic assessment tools and related um, templates to implement um, those tools um, within the next um, year or so. And so here you see for the responsibility um, sub principle number one for positive relationships, we're drawing from the Maori Data Sovereignty Charter around the collection, use and interpretation of data shall uphold the dignity of indigenous communities, groups and individuals. And so that's how we're kind of um, collating using um, what entities have set out again, like we did in the creation of the care principles, and then um, kind of digesting that and thinking about that, what that means at a very high level. We've also seen the recognition of indigenous data sovereignty um, really grow and flourish, especially over the past two or three years. Um, we've seen indigenous data sovereignty um, um, written out and explained in the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to privacy around the recommended uh, recommendation on the protection and use of health related data. Um, the Research Data Alliance has a section on it and uh, around COVID um, data guidelines. Um, we've seen statements from um, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Policy Partnership. Um, statement on open science as well as UNESCO recommendation on open science. Um, we've seen education occurring around from ORCID and other entities um, around their responsibilities. Um, and um, one of the examples I'll show is the Australian um, IATSIS Code of Ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research. Here in the US, um, we've had some movement. It's a little bit different than in other realms. And so um, while we've had seen resolutions <clears throat> including one specifically on indigenous data sovereignty, but I think there's now six or seven of them related to indigenous data at the National Congress of American Indians. So that's our national body that um, re represents many of the tribes in the US as a, as a, um, um, as a network of tribes. Um, more recently, we there's an indigenous data sovereignty statement from the American Medical Association that was released. Um, and that um, details not only the rights and interests of indigenous peoples, but the responsibilities of um, entities, including federal agencies to support um, indigenous research oversight. Um, and then one of the things that we have really strong developments in um, here in the US is around tribal and community advances and research and institutional advances. And so um, we have tribal IRBs and tribal research review processes to a larger degree than in, in most other countries. Um, we have um, engagement and advocacy occurring um, and we have practices such as using data sharing agreements and we've seen those grow and advance to include more things like publication practices and metadata. Um, as, as parts goes on, we um, are beginning to see how this engages with things like the um, NIH um, data management plan um, and all of those types of strategies. How do we make sure that we embed strong indigenous um, uh, rights and uh, governance within those plans? Um, and then we see research and institutional advances. I talked about our own advances here at the University of Arizona, where we have heightened responsibilities around institution or um, when we go for human subjects review. Um, we also have what I call as that scaffolding of, of policies. So our Board of Regents has a policy on tribal engagement. We have um, a University of Arizona policy on tribal engagement, official policy, and then we have a, um, guidelines that set out how we do that. And then we use as researchers, data management plans, MOUs, and other agreements to um, set out that relationship around data with communities. 
Um, I'm going to close up here with revisiting some slides, but first, the um, IATSIS is an Australian government statutory authority that is Indigenous-led and serving. So um, in 2021, maybe it released a mandatory code for research with Abog Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that details Indigenous rights to data, the need for ongoing ownership and access to data for Indigenous peoples, and the requirement of the application of fair and care and research data relationships. So two important things. One is that um, that is being used to evaluate research now and whether or not it occurs um, in not only research at institutions, but for instance, research at the um, Australian Board of Statistics and whether or not they can do the research project itself. Um, so this is really strong and has a lot of teeth. And not only is it strong and has teeth, but it's really super thoughtful. So I can I really um, encourage everybody to look at it. This um, diagram here that you see um, really expand. Sometimes in the U.S. we think about the four R's um, or the seven R's and thinking about reciprocity, responsibilities, and so on. This really puts it in context and action um, around research and data. Um, and so I do encourage folks to look at that. Um, and so um, I'm going to head back to this model of tribal engagement or tribal involvement in the research process, which we really always talk about how um, that that engagement needs to start with a partnership or a relationship really and grow through that. Um, but I wanna underscore that it is not just about the research process, it's also about um, being creating these um, mechanisms for the data. So the, the babies and the information that we create in that research pro process, so the actual kind of outputs of that process, how do we make sure that it's as open as possible but as closed as necessary given indigenous standards and indigenous values. Um, and so I'm just gonna close again with saying um, that um, I'm, I'm obviously really excited about all this work, but that this work comes from our ancestors um, and it is a responsibility that we have as indigenous peoples. And it also is also from a human perspective, a responsibility to uphold the dignity um, and the rights of peoples broadly. So the future is indigenous. Um, indigenous peoples are leaders in the data world seeking to transition community held roles, values, and expectations into the di digital environment. So we're here, we're still here, um, and I'm really grateful for all of this engagement today. Thank you, and I'm gonna stop share so I can talk with folks. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Carroll. This is just amazing. It's been um, a plethora of amazing information. It's uh, creative, it's timely, it's uh, anchored, um, it, it's ethical. It's just really inspiring in so many ways. And I think we're getting a lot of uh, comments in the Q&A, even more so than questions sometimes about um, the appreciation for this work. You know, probably the number one question people are asking is that this was a lot of information. You know, is your slide deck available somewhere? Maybe if something's on a, a link somewhere, maybe we can share it with folks um, after after we're done today. Um, but folks, we have about twenty minutes for exchange, and so I have a Q and A here that I'm going to look into as well as some questions that I've thought of. So please, if you have questions or comments. For Dr. Carroll, go ahead and post them in the Q and A, and I'll get to as many as I can. Um, one thing I wanted to start with, just though, Stephanie, if we can, is you know some people who are not that familiar with Indigenous community life and research history, you know, might be thinking, "Oh my God, what what is this all about?" And you know, they don't even necessarily know some of the egregious examples of exploitative research. So I wonder, just very briefly, I don't think we need a great in depth thing, but could you give what you consider to be some of the most egregious examples? of researchers who have taken advantage of Indian communities or indigenous communities and uh, in, in some ways of, you know, misused data in a way that makes all of this really necessary. Sure. So um, there are historical and contemporary ongoing examples of how this occurs. I think one of the most well um, known cases was between um, the actually the Arizona Board of Regents out of Arizona State University and um, the Havasupai tribe. Um, and so um, Dr. Terry Marco, who was a, a, a researcher at the Arizona State University at the time entered into some health related research um, around um, uh, genetic information and diabetes with um, the Havasupai tribe and um, 
took those specimens. This was this was years ago, so our consenting procedures weren't the same that they are now, but still I don't think they're robust enough to protect against this. Um, and so later on um, allowed others to use that data without reconsent and for different purposes than was originally consented for. Um, and um, those those data were were used to make assertions around, um, for instance, schizophrenia. Um, and the, the roots of schizophrenia, but also really challenged our own knowledges about our origins. Um, and um, it was only found out because somebody who had participated attended the presentation and saw this. And so this resulted in a lawsuit between um, the, the tribe and the board of regents. It was settled out of court, um, which um, there were, there were, um, there was uh, different things given back to the tribe for the egregious offenses, um, but without a sometimes without a legal precedent, right? We have not as much teeth. So we have the story, um, and um, we don't have as much about um, convincing people that this actually occurred. So I talk to people almost every month who still believe, oh, it wasn't that bad. It was bad. Um, and some of our policies have moved forward so we have better consenting procedures, but we still don't have collective consent. We still haven't worked through in our own practices things like how do we maybe have ongoing consent or dynamic consent when we take samples from people and what's the role of that in terms of um, being able to do research into the future. Yeah. Thank you for that. Very helpful background information. And you know, there's some uh, competing goods we might think of potentially that um, uh, 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 pertain to a lot of what we're discussing today. And I think, you know, the biggest casualty for university-based researchers who are socialized without consideration of indigenous uh, rights and needs and sovereignty and so on is this idea of academic freedom. Uh, as you know, researchers at universities, uh, especially a tenured professoriate, um, are sort of protected in terms of the ability to inquire and to engage in knowledge production and scholarly inquiry in ways that are supposedly, um, you know, immune from uh, political and partisan kinds of attack. Um, and, and yet, what you're describing here really, I think, sounds a, a kind of deep, deep, deep limitation on what scholars who are not familiar with these issues think of as sort of academic freedom and their rights as scholars to engage in knowledge production. So I would just wonder, I mean, there's an easy case that it'd be great to hear your thoughts on, but the harder case might be indigenous academics or indigenous scholars who are interested in, in what may be saying something critical about their own communities and for whom these kinds of um, you know, uh, advances might really shut down the ability of people to engage in, in tribal discussion and tribal life. Yeah, so I think there's there's two things. Yes, this has been used as a tool by institutions and individual researchers to say, I can't participate because it's gonna limit my right to talk about what I'm doing or, or what's going on. Um, I have made the argument um, and, I, and I've heard others make it. And actually sometimes, you know, it, it comes better from non-Indigenous researchers to make the argument that if we want our research to stand the test of time, as, as the world evolves, as our data relationships evolve, as research ethics evolve, we need to attend to those rights and interests now. Um, we, the worst thing that could happen is that our research is devalued um, or, or erased into the future, right? Because then your work is not recognized. Um, the other bit of that that kind of relates is if you don't do this work in a way that's in relationship to communities, you're not really having valid and reliable data or research, right? So the, the validity and reli reliability is not just dependent on the Western schemas that we've all been taught in institutions. It is, it is also dependent on um, the communities in which we work. And so those two are really tied together. I think as an indigenous scholar, if, if those of you look at my um, Google Scholar page, I saw somebody point out there or, or other work, there are ways of getting around this kind of responsibility to publish as a scholar. Um, it, that, um, you know, some of the work I do isn't publishable because of agreements with tribes, right? Um, but I can publish on um, how you do this work at a collective level and what the responsibilities are. Um, and also the, the different ways that we do this as Indigenous scholars. Um, that's one of the most important things to put out there and document is um, what are the processes that we have coming from our own communities, coming from Indigenous scholars um, to do this, this work in the right way? Thank you. Wonderful. Um, 
You talked about one of the instances of recording indigenous belonging, even in authorship um, and citation practices. And I think this also um, is a little unusual for what people are socialized to, into into academic knowledge production, in which there is, at least in some areas, a sense that identity and ideas really are somewhat independent. The idea that ideas can be adjudicated and evaluated and assessed on their own terms, who, no matter who says them. They're completely abstractable, if you will, from the person who's saying them. And yet a lot of what we're talking about today is the importance of indigenous identity, indigeneity, featuring and factoring into knowledge and ideas. So I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on you know, what might be competing goods in that domain. Yeah, I think, you know, we see this more and more today, especially as our life is um, almost dictated by algorithms um, and by thinking through how data relate to us at every moment. And so there is and has been this longstanding perception uh, for from a data perspective that data are neutral. Um, but we know that they're not created in a vacuum. So somebody is deciding somewhere, inserting their own bias or the bias of their institution into what's the right way to measure, um, for instance, um, how many salmon there are in the river this year, um, or what's the, what's the um, right application of something like BMI in an indigenous community, right? And so there are decisions being made every day. And basically there's no neutral zone. Um, the neutral zone is a farce. Um, and so the ability to think through and to really assess what the, the, the environment is in which you're working is really important. Um, and also what is a value? So when we're talking about how do we measure things um, or how do we write about things, um, what, is, what is important to be measuring, right? Um, and so some, I think back to some of the work I did um, early on in my career when I'm asking and working with tries about measuring health outcomes and they want to measure, I, for instance, I was in one conversation about measuring how many women were in um, elected government positions because it was a matriarchal society and, and be, through federal colonialism, they were largely led by men. And so how do we create and understand how it's not only elected positions that influence how we move forward, um, it is also um, non-elected positions, but the role of women in elected positions, but also how that relates to health and the health of the community. Yeah, great. Um, you talked a little bit about open access today. And as you know, academic knowledge production is in, tied up intimately with journal production, particularly in the sciences and the health sciences, the behavioral sciences. Um, and journal production uh, is massively profitable for the corporations because it's you know, more or less uncompensated academic labor that goes into review and so on. Um, open access you know, was seen to be a potential remedy to democratize access to knowledge you know, because it's not behind a journal paywall where people have, you know, these journal articles can cost 50 bucks just to buy one journal article. Um, but you mentioned earlier and someone wrote in, um, you implied that open access publication policies may be harmful rather than helpful to indigenous peoples. Could you expand on that, please? Yeah, so generally broadly open access policies can be harmful. So if we think about open access to data, um, open access to publications. Um, so taken out of context definitely can be harmful. Um, and there's this mantra that I think was actually came out of some work in Europe that's um, about as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, so thinking through how you, how you um, not only measure harms and benefits, but actually rights and interests in that sphere. Um, I am an ardent supporter of the necessity of making publications open access. Um, I'm, I'm committed in the work that I do to having open access for the publications that I lead, but it's complex, right? Um, because it costs money, as you said. Um, and it's also in different disciplines, it's harder or easier to get somebody to support that. Um, we're going to see a lot of movement around this. There was a recent memo that's now out of um, the federal government that's referred to as the Nelson memo that's increasing requirements around open access and public access to publicly funded research. Um, and yesterday actually was, I think, the deadline for federal agencies to submit some draft comments around that. Um, and so this is really important important because it is um, when we think about it's it's not just publications um, and so publications are fraught because it creates different differences within um, who can publish um, open access because it costs so much money um, and where people can publish um, if they don't have that money increasingly I hear researchers talk about how they pay out of pocket to make things open access um, and this is just uh, 
egregious in terms of making information free, right? Um, so that whole schema is, is convoluted and complex, but also making data open access is really, really contentious within a lot of spheres. Um, and thinking about that, like I said, as open as possible, as closed as necessary is really um, important to put that into thinking through um, what's the role of managed um, access versus open access. So having schemas for who can access what levels of data. Um, indigenous peoples broadly are not opposed to having freely open information. It's just being able to assess what information um, needs to be most protected and cared for um, and is most sensitive from a from a Maori perspective. It's uh, often talked about as a treasure, as a Tonga data or a Tonga, or, and um, we need to think about how we care for it. Um, and so some of it needs to be kept close. Others are useful outside of our spheres, and sometimes that crosses the lines. Yeah, well, um, thank you for that. Um, you know, one, so one of the questions has to do with, you know, how this takes shape on the ground. So you're necessarily and clearly focusing on the high order principles. And you've talked about how they uh, anchor down at some point into uh, tribal communities, uh, decisions and actions. Um, I think, um, you know, tribes have limited capacity in many instances. I'm from the Northern Plains where we have famously limited capacity for a million things. You know, what would you say are the like the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest uh, strategies and actions that a tribal community should be taking to secure data sovereignty, um, which doesn't involve and entail a, a huge number of resources? Yeah, so there's a there's a few things. One is um, really thinking about what your areas of concern are. Are they about, for instance, like language recordings that somebody holds? So those um, local context labels that I talked about actually started because the uh, Library of Congress has a wax cylinder recording um, of the Passamaquoddy tribe. Um, and that's their oldest wax cylinder recording at the Library of Congress. And they wouldn't give it back. Right. So how do we make sure that we have persistent relationships and can actually take back some of our, our languages that have been taken by others? And sometimes um, people are making money off of our, our, our languages, which is um, who we are at our heart. Um, so what are the areas that you want to and are most concerned about and working in those areas? Um, I think some of the other real innovations that we see are how do we um, really support the growth of um, not only tribal sovereignty and tribal governance um, that is occurring within tribal governments, um, but also support the growth of tribal nonprofits and indigenous um, um, individual led efforts. So the, for instance, I said, I talked about the native biodata consortium. So how do we think about making um, either regional level or um, 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 on indigenous lands, um, innovations in data storage, data access, and data reuse that adhere to our own values, um, instead of always trying to change what others are doing with our information. So how do we lead in that way? Um, that's definitely another way. Um, the other thing that I see is this real upswing and, and um, and interest in how do we strengthen, for instance, our tribal research review processes. Um, and that's been, um, that I think is another ripe area is, is how do we advance what policies are on the ground already and happening? Um, and how do we think about what happens at scale? I mean, I'm from a small community. Um, we can't field a, a whole IRB like Navajo Nation does, right? Um, but, and so what does this look like at scale? Thanks for that. Um, you know, uh, I've had uh, students go through the IRB here at Harvard only to learn and then have to sort of grapple with the idea that Harvard apparently pretty um, unilaterally asserts ownership and control of any data done by Harvard affiliated researchers. And I'm sure you know this is common. Um, uh, our colleague, Dr. Beth Rink from Montana State writes, what recommendations do you have for how to address intellectual property rights when a quote unquote product is developed as part of a tribal academic research partnership. In particular, when academic institutions that have historically believed and have policies of support that they have the right to all intellectual property developed by researchers created as part of their work as faculty at an institution. Yeah, so um, 
I'm going to go on a tangent here for a moment and say I gave that example of COVID data from New Mexico. And when, when that COVID scenario happened, um, I was shocked because New Mexico, I thought, had these really great um, relationships with tribes for advancing um, tribal data sovereignty, especially in the health realm. But what happened was nothing was on paper. And so when push come to shove and we were all freaked out, um, it just reverted to form basically. And, 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 um, so dam damages occurred. And what happens, I think in academia is that we, there are a number of institutions who have been for decades working with tribes for tribal ownership of data, tribal restrictions on publications, um, and so forth, but they do it in behind the scenes. They do it quietly and they don't share it. And so um, we really need to push our institutions who do things in that way to talk about it more aggressively and to share how those are. And so um, uh, one of the activities that we're doing in terms of work from the collaboratory and other entities is to try to push forward with thinking through how do we um, provide process templates to move forward um, around data sharing, around data ownership to, inst to institutions and tribes so that they can better assort their data, um, their data. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, someone writes, you know, very concretely, is there a resource of examples of tribal university team research agreements that meet these fair and care principles? No, but we do have um, we do <laughs> we do have a process in place now. Through um, I talked about Riley Tatingpong, she's now a, a, um, a postdoc with the collaboratory, and so some of the funding we have from the Loose Foundation actually is supporting the creation of um, an interactive platform for um, those processes and templates and examples. Great. You know, the National Institutes on, of Health obviously is a major federal funder of health research in the nation. The National Science Foundation for other kinds of research. You know, the NIH actually established a tribal health research office that was an effort to try to be a more accountable to tribal leaders around how we think about health research and data, et cetera. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, if um, we think about um, th these sorts of issues, what, what do you think the prospects or the promise is of something like a tribal health research office to try to start to bend NIH toward recognition of some of these very important principles that you've been promoting? Yeah, I think it's really important um, and it has been a significant advance. We see other places like NSF has a working group now um, around these and they actually had somebody seconded to NIH to, to work with the Tribal Health Research Office for a little bit um, to start thinking about it. Um, you know, most in institutions have some sort of policy around indigenous research or something like that. Um, notably, NSF does not. Um, uh, Smithsonian does not. <laughs> so the, there's a, a little shock in there. Um, there's been some advances at the at Smithsonian around that, but um, really standing up those offices and having indigenous leaders in those positions is important. Um, and I think it's also important to really leverage the allies because, you know, we always have opposition to the work that we're doing. It's inherently political, um, whether or not people want to admit that, um, you know, those of us who do this work in academia are often told that we're, we're being advocates, not scholars, um, but there is a role for scholar advocates. Um, and that's um, importantly as indigenous peoples, kind of the role we take often because um, we've been, the our rights have been subjugated in these arenas. And so having Having, um, standing that up is important. Uh, you know, sometimes it is um, frustrating, though, because um, we have we often see things that are just put there to say that we're doing something, um, but nothing's really happening. And so we need um, continuous voices from um, tribal leaders, from tribal um, programs, from our allies, um, and really to uplift the really innovative and advancing work that particularly young scholars are doing today. Well, thanks. One final question. Um, you know, you talked about how so much research is deficit focused and in some ways portrays indigenous communities in a, a very negative, unfavorable light in lots of ways. Um, the indigenous studies scholar Eve Tuck has talked about our need to suspend damage uh, kinds of analyses in scholarly research in general about Indian country or indigenous communities. And I'm just, all of us have to white, walk this tightrope, I suppose, of how much do we want to get public understanding of some of our desperate needs. Some of our needs are truly desperate. 
And yet we're not trying to circulate damage research, but we're trying to get attention to a need. And we want to counterbalance that, of course, in the ways you're talking about with strengths-based research that talk about rights and agency and creativity and innovation, all those kinds of things. I just wonder if you could reflect for you know 30 seconds on how you go about trying to counterbalance those competing demands. Yeah, I think really giving voice to um, community stories and community needs is one of the most foundational aspects of it. So what is the, what? how is this in community? What does this mean in community? And what is the impact on us as Indigenous scholars? You know, I think back to like um, in the fall of 2020, I, I taught an Indigenous public health course and I had 10 students in it. They were all Indigenous. Our faculty for it was all Indigenous. And just the impacts on us from COVID and from the COVID experience and uh, were so different from the stories when I went to faculty meetings from other professors and what they were experiencing. And so really to be able to talk to it from our own perspectives and also elevate that voice as this is what we need, right? And so um, elevating the success that we have and when we make our own decisions and we're able to create our own programs that, that respond to our own needs, really what that means in terms of wise practices versus like external best practices. Professor Carroll, it has been a delight to host you today. I'm so grateful for your sharing this really important information with a pretty broad audience. And I think a lot of folks are going to be reaching out to you and your folks to try to get more information, more access, download resources, access your articles, and so on. But I just want to thank you again for joining us. And um, Scott, I wonder if you want to say uh, anything about the next uh, seminar um, before we um, wrap up today. Sure. Again, I also want to add my thanks to Dr. Carroll, of, always to, to, to Dr. Gan and to our audience for your thoughtful questions. And our, our next meeting will be on March 8th at noon with Maxine Burkett um, on climate justice and as a guide to climate politics and climate science. So please, welcome, please join us on March 8th at noon. And I will just finally say, too, that our next Indigenous Health uh, well and Wellbeing Colloquium will be in April 24th, which is Wednesday. It'll feature Dr. Teresa LaFromboise talking about uh, her suicide prevention research. Thanks again, Dr. Carroll. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.